بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أحمده وأصلي على رسول الكريم. Today I want to talk about Santa Claus and Christmas, and more so, probably about Santa Claus. And then I want you to tell me what you think. Yes, I'm going to talk about how Santa Claus relates to the one-eyed man, the one-eyed man who is followed by, uh, the one-eyed man who is followed by Yajuj and Majuj. So remember, I'll be talking about that. But before I talk about that, I want to talk about other aspects of Christmas. I want to talk a, a macro view of the whole Christmas situation, and then we will see how uh, Christmas may relate. You know, Santa Claus Christianity may relate to the end of times in terms of their celebration of Christmas, particularly in reference to Santa Claus. Now, so let's get started. What is it? An old banana. An old banana? Isn't that exciting? Wow. A battery and an onion. What's wrong? I don't want an onion. Did you smell your onion? Here, smell it. What do you tell me all the time about my cooking? I love it. You love my cooking, so I made you something. So you don't want that peanut butter and jelly sandwich? I'll eat it. I'll eat it. Open it up. You don't want that for Christmas? You're stinking parents! Take this back. Take it back where? This is yours. What did you say about Santa? He put you on the naughty list. Why? Because you gave me a stupid little kid again. What did you get, Jason? Some black beans, cheese, and a Waffle House hat. What's in there? A feather. Oh, you got a Mr. Potato Head. That's from Santa. The nuts. Did Santa I did not have those things. You Well, Jimmy Kimmel told me to do it. <laughs> well, tell him 
suck my balls. <laughs> All jokes aside, that actually happens in Christmas a lot. A lot of kids get presents they just don't want. Parents try to give the kids presents that they think they need. And kids are expecting the presents that they want. And so that that's a reality. That happens. I've actually seen it myself in my life, that happening. As I was growing up and as I saw, uh, you know, me counseling people, uh, that's, that's, that really happens. I mean, you know, all the jokes aside, that really happens. People get presents and they are not very happy about it. And so, of course, uh, the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that giving gifts increases love. And, uh, that is true. So that aspect is also relevant and true. So, you know, any civilization and people can do something that has something good in it. But, what I showed you in the form of this comedy is also very true. And that is because of the intentions. The intentions are very different. But now let us go on and look at another aspect of Christmas. So in, in terms of the commercialization of Christmas, here is a pretty good way of looking at uh, the commercialization of Christmas. Complaints about excessive... If you've ever said, Christmas has gone too commercial, well, you're not the first. Complaints about excessive spending during the holidays go back over a hundred years when Victorians lamented about having to buy cards and gifts for all their acquaintances and recoiled from the garishness of London's department store displays. Today, we're so used to the marriage of Christmas and shopping that we rarely stop to wonder how it got this way. Is there something inherent about the holiday that makes it so expensive? And is it really good for us? Or the economy? Many people think the tradition of gift giving comes from the story of the Magi in the New Testament who visited baby Jesus with gifts of gold, frankincense, and money. But swapping handmade gifts was already a part of pagan winter festivals like the Roman Saturnalia, a raucous week-long party which took place in late December. As Christianity spread across Europe, keeping the schedules and traditions of established holidays made it more attractive to prospective converts, so sometime around 300 AD, the church officially moved Jesus' birthday to December 25th. For over a thousand years, Christmas ambled along as a minor observance, nowhere near as important as the major Christian holiday, Easter. In the 1600s, Puritans like Oliver Cromwell and the pilgrims who settled America outright banned the celebration of Christmas because they found it too decadent and pagany. It really wasn't until the early 1800s that Christmas, as we know it today, started to take shape thanks largely to authors like Charles Dickens, Washington Irving, and Clement Clark Moore, who assembled some of their favorite holiday customs into a standardized package. They rebranded it as a family-centric celebration with a strong emphasis on generosity. That meant sharing meals, donating to charity, and of course, gift giving. Gifts were still mostly handmade, but a lot of money was spent on food. Whether you were a poulterer, a baker, a brewer, or a fruiterer, it's a word, December was the busy and profitable month. As the Industrial Revolution kicked into high gear, urban populations increased and manufactured goods became widely available to a burgeoning middle class. Gifts shifted from something you made to something you bought. By the end of the 1800s, Christmas had been commandeered by an institution that would hold it hostage for a hundred years, the department store. These all-in-one mega retailers would go all out with elaborate decorations and window displays that attracted huge crowds. Print catalogs offered an easy way to make wish lists. And in 1890, an American businessman named James Edgar had a crazy idea of dressing up as Santa Claus at his Massachusetts department store and boy, did that catch up. Everyone knows that Christmas time seems to start earlier every year. But you might be surprised to learn that the first people to advocate early shopping were not retailers, but labor activists. 
The season had become so busy that the government allowed businesses to ignore labor laws during the month of December, and employees were routinely overworked, many of them children. In her essay, The Travesty of Christmas, NAACP co-founder Florence Kelly advocated early shopping as a way to alleviate the pressure on workers and recounts the story of a boy who died of exposure after working an 18-hour shift delivering Christmas gifts in New York's freezing winter. Department stores were happy to make the holiday season as long as possible, but they had a sort of unwritten rule amongst them that they wouldn't start promoting Christmas until after Thanksgiving. So FDR pushed the official date of Thanksgiving from the last Thursday in November to the fourth Thursday in November in order to squeeze as many days as possible into the shopping season. Starting in the early 50s, the day after Thanksgiving became known as Black Friday as a reference to the general chaos that resulted from workers calling in sick to get a four-day weekend. By the 1960s, police departments had adopted the usage to describe the overwhelming crowds and traffic caused by the onset of holiday shopping. Retailers embraced the name with Black Friday sales and promotions, though they did attempt to rebrand the origins of the term into something more positive. Despite what you've heard, Black Friday is not a reference to the day businesses get back in the black. Stores have been steadily pushing back the opening time on Black Friday in the last few decades, from dawn to midnight, even to Thanksgiving evening, prompting some strikes by workers robbed at their holiday dinner with the family. Today, Black Friday is something of a controversy, with viral videos of mobs pushing and fighting each other for the best bargains. It's become a symbol of the greed and competitiveness that Christmas is not supposed to be about, tragically epitomized by the death of a Long Island Walmart employee who was trampled by 200 frenzied shoppers who broke through the glass doors before the store opened. Both Oliver Cromwell and Florence Kelly would be very disappointed if they were alive today. And they'd be very confused by the newest form of holiday consumerism, online Christmas shopping. While e-commerce only represents around 17% holiday shopping, that number has been steadily growing over the past decade, particularly focused on a day that the National Retail Federation dubbed Cyber Monday. That's right, three days after Black Friday, after a tiring weekend of mall walking, it seems that many people decide to finish up their holiday shopping on the web, and more than half of these orders are placed from work computers. Only on lunch breaks, right guys? Even if you find all this commercialism distasteful, you still have to admit that this annual spending spree is good for the economy, right? Maybe not. While many retailers indeed depend on Christmas to remain profitable, there are concerns that have nothing to do with spirituality or tradition. Economics professor Joel Waldfogel famously called Christmas a deadweight loss, which basically means that it's a lot of spending without an equivalent positive gain. For instance, if I give Philip a $10 bill, I lost 10 bucks, but he's gained 10 bucks, so the overall economy has broken even. But if I give Julia a $10 gift that she doesn't want and she just sticks it on a shelf in the garage or even throws it away, I'm out 10 bucks without any equivalent gain elsewhere that didn't end up being used or without any equivalent gain elsewhere. Think of all the millions of Christmas gifts people have given or received that didn't end up being used or enjoyed. They've all contributed to a dead weight loss on the economy, estimated by Walpole to be around four to thirteen billion dollars a year. But you might think So we've talked a little bit about the materialistic aspect of Christmas, which I will come back to towards the end. But now let's start our first step in understanding what is the relationship between Santa Claus himself and the one-eyed man who is followed by a group called Ya'juj and Ma'juj. So, in that respect, let's get started. Now, this is a understanding of the history of how Christmas came about and the pagan roots. Christmas. It's the time of year when we in the West celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ with nice things like nativity plays and carol singing where we sing about Jesus and God and all of these very Christian things. And of course the name is Christ Mass. It goes right back to this old Christian idea. So Christmas must be incredibly Christian and all about Jesus and God and the Bible, right? Well, not quite. In this video I'm going to be looking at the pagan and mostly the Northern European pagan origins of Christmas and some of the things we did. So you see this man here who has no, has one eye. So that's what, this is all going to go to the man with the one eye 
who is followed by Ya'juj and Ma'juj. Christmas Day is celebrated on the 25th of December, although there is no real link to this with the birth of Jesus Christ. We're not actually sure on which day he was born. However, there is a very strong link to one of the festivals called Yol by the Old Norse, Yolo by the Old Frisians, and Yeol by the Old English. And this festival was a very important part of the pagan calendar, not only in the northern European pagan traditions, but also in many other ones around the world, as it coincided with one of the major changes in the year to do with the harvests. Now, Yol, if we look at the Old Frisian word, or Yolo, we see that it actually means wheel. And the reason for this is that the old Germanic people saw the year as being in a wheel shape, and that the very bottom of the wheel was December. The reason for this was that at the very bottom of the wheel, the days were the shortest. It's on the 21st of December that we think that the pagans back then, and indeed neo-pagans today, still celebrate the winter solstice, which is the shortest day of the year, because from that point on, the wheel starts to go back up, as in the days start getting longer. And it's actually seen in the old Germanic tradition as being a sort of war against light, against dark. Obviously, winter is when the days, especially in the north and northern Europe, when the days get shorter, there's obviously much longer nights, so people would see that which other religion talks about light and darkness fighting against each other? Anyone know? The Zoroastrians. The Zoroastrians connects directly with which surah of the Quran? Surah Al-Kahf. So just keep this in mind for those of you that know this as, you know, the, the darkest season of the year. And obviously the 21st of December is when the days start getting lighter, start getting longer, and when the light starts winning again. And obviously this is very much related to the idea that at the end of the world, at Ragnarok, the twilight of the gods, the huge Fenris wolf would break loose and would eventually eat the sun, heralding the start of the Fimbul winter, which was this terrible winter that would last a long time. So Yol, for the Germanic peoples, was a time for celebration when they tried to bring as much light into the houses and uh, into people's hearts. And one of the ways they did this was by giving each other presents. Now again, if you are in a society where they do this, Christmas lights, things like that, with candles and whatnot, all goes back to this idea of the light winning against the darkness, which isn't just in paganism, it's also in Hinduism and to a lesser extent Christianity as well. It's not it's not solely related to paganism, but that's the topic of this video. And in this season, people would give each other gifts. Families would give each other gifts at this time, obviously to uh, celebrate and to celebrate the light coming back, as well as bringing evergreens into the houses, as evergreens were also signs that things carried on, that it was part, all part of the wheel of life that they believed in, and that then the, the days were actually getting lighter again, and things were becoming green again. So again, this is another symbolism for the fact that light is triumphing over darkness. And obviously, we still do this by bringing in Christmas trees and they sort of amalgamate the two by bringing in a tree, an evergreen, so usually a fir or a pine, and by decorating these trees. Now, why trees, you might ask? Well, trees were very important for our Germanic forefathers, because, of course, the will tree, the very tree that they believed the world was a part of, was called the Grazil, and the Grazil was essentially a huge tree, with at the bottom of it you have Nidhogger, who is um, this dragon who gnaws on the roots, and all the different worlds, so the worlds of men, of giants, of uh, elves, dwarves, uh, all of this, they all sit on this tree, so obviously it's hugely important. And actually, Odin, the head god, the chief god, um, he actually hung from the Grazil for nine days and nine nights, uh, in his quest for wisdom. So obviously there is a deep connection and various deities actually have Now just remember Odin is the chief god of these people of this pagan group Specific trees that are dedicated to them and for example when Boniface went to Frisia and decided to chop down um, It's called Donos Eich in Dutch um, So uh, Donos Eich which is the oak tree of Thor. Oak trees were related to Thor This is why the Frisians killed him because trees were really important to the Germanic peoples And of course he was contributing to deforestation, which wasn't cool Boniface. You want to sort that attitude out now, another interesting thing about plants in the season is mistletoe. And for those of you who aren't aware, there is a tradition in the West, at least in Britain, and I'm fairly sure over the over the pond as well and in other parts, that if two people, usually a lad and a lass, although anyone else, uh, that's fine, um, if they meet under mistletoe, then they have to kiss. And this tradition also probably goes back to the old pagan traditions and to a god called Baldur. Now, Baldur was the son of Odin, and he is the god of light and happiness and essentially pure, nice, good things. But he was actually killed by a trickster god called Loki, who tricked his brother Hoder, who was blind and also a smith, I believe, into killing him with a staff of mistletoe. Now, you might think it's weird that then mistletoe is this good, nice item, but actually there is an idea that in one version of the story, Baldur eventually comes back, and that's another kind of thing in the Norse myths and things, that the a lot of it is still things that are to come, so Ragnarok hasn't happened yet, it's still going to come, and it's the same with Baldur, they believe Baldur will come back at some point, so they then connect mistletoe with Baldur, with happiness and goodness, that kind of thing, as well as perhaps being connected to Freya, because in some versions of the story, um, Baldur is brought back to life, and then Freya to sort of um, cover up the whole misdoing of the, the spear of mistletoe, the arrow of mistletoe that killed him, makes mistletoe this plant of love and happiness and kindness, because of course Freya is the goddess of love as well, so then you have that connection there. And I should also mention that mistletoe is very important to the Celtic peoples, especially to the Druidic class who probably used it in various rituals, and the white berries in the Norse mythology at least are said to be the tears of Freya, who wept obviously when her son Baldur was killed. So, in a previous video, I talked about Sinterklaas, who is essentially the Dutch kind of Santa Claus figure, although we uh, celebrate that on the 5th of December rather than the 25th. And I did mention that Father Christmas as well is sort of a more British and older spirit, but they are very much related. And actually, when you compare Sinterklaas or Father Christmas, actually, with Odin, the Germanic chief god... So, Odin is this blind man, <coughs> you know, who has a horse, 
a cloak, a hat, a staff, <coughs> a long beard, old and wise, gives letters, and, you know, has to do with the occult sciences, which I'll talk about later. So it was this guy that became Santa Claus. Okay, so keep this in mind. Now, these people, the Germanic people, uh, they are the people of Yajuj and Majuj, and I'm going to show that to you from very clearly. I'm going to show that to you. So uh, here you have uh, the blind-eyed man who, you know, also flies in the sky, has deers uh, with him, who has elves like jinns around him. You have this whole uh, thing. And uh, so let us continue watching this and things will become more and more clear as uh, this continues. You see a lot of similarities between them, as they are all essentially based on the same character. So you see that this, again, the whole idea of Santa Claus is very much based on the one-eyed wandering god who also flew through the sky, who also gave things to men, uh, and that kind of thing, which is very interesting once again. And he is actually Odin. One of his names is the Yolfather. And the Yolfather means, again, Yol from the same thing as we get a Yule in English is sometimes used, and uh, Yule in various Scandinavian languages. So he was called the Yule Father, which is literally Father Christmas, but then um, with the different words that they used at the time, which is very interesting once again. And it's thought that perhaps the word jolly came into English from uh, French, actually, in a similar route from Jolly and uh, Yule or Yule. And of course, Odin is famous for the Wild Hunt, which took place at some point during the winter as well, which is essentially where he and lots of other riders would ride through the sky and uh, chase after another mystical animal. And anyone who was wandering sort of outside at this time had to be very careful, because otherwise they would be dragged along with this Wild Hunt. People had to sort of bow down onto the road and not look up as the Wild Hunt passed over. And this again is a, a very interesting concept that I'll make more videos about in future. And actually, Yol was a very big deal for the Scandinavians and for the Northern Germanic tribes, because there was a lot of celebrating to be done. Again, it's celebrating the fact that light triumphs over darkness, um, and actually in Norway, the first Christian king of Norway, actually Hawkon, uh, Hawkon den Gorda, or uh, Hawkon the Good, he actually made it compulsory for people to drink a substantial amount of alcohol over all the days during the feast, and it was him, it was he who brought um, the sort of the Christian Christmas kind of feast to be on the same days as Yule, as um, Yule, so the, the festival of the pagans, and while he was a Christian king, he at that time needed the support of the pagan earls, so he didn't do much to convert the Scandinavians, but it's interesting that he then made it compulsory for people to do this. And it seems that horse meat and the consumption of horse meat was a very important part of the Yule festival, as were making oaths. So, for example, Ragnar Lothbrok, he, the reason he went to England with two ships and was then ended up being thrown in a snake pit was because while he was drunk, he made a boast, an oath to gods, to the Asir, that he would go over to England and capture Northumbria with two shiploads of men, which didn't go very well. But these oaths were taken incredibly seriously by the North Germanic peoples of the time. And, you know, these oaths are the reason why we have New Year's resolutions, which are essentially also oaths, although many people don't end up sticking to them. That also comes down to all the feasting and celebrating throughout Yule, which is usually a few weeks long. And they then promise uh, they swear an oath to do something. And as well, you have that this is often called a blot. Blot is the old Norse word for blood, and blood comes down to the fact that they would sacrifice an animal during this time and eat it to make a big feast out of it. And what do we do? We all sacrifice our turkeys and eat those. So, you know, you can thank, thank the uh, old Germanic peoples for that as well. So, thank you very much for watching. I hope this has been somewhat interesting. So, let's now go to the actual uh, people that uh, still celebrate. Uh, and understand, you know, we go to the Norwegians, uh, these, these areas where they're still celebrating the pagan holidays, and uh, they're going to explain the pagan holidays and its connection with Christianity in you know, the Santa Claus Christianity, so to say. Okay? Uh, so here we go. We would like to take this opportunity to share with you a bit of how Vikings celebrated around this time of year and how that still influences us up here in the north today. The very name Christmas, for instance, never stuck with the Vikings. They call it Yule, and so do we still today. Yule is the Old Norse word for the festivities held during the midwinter solstice here in Scandinavia. One of the most important traditions that still lives on is the Yule Ham. The Yule Ham is usually the centerpiece of every Yule Bud or Christmas buffet, and it represents Sad Imna, the pig that was eaten in Valhalla, or sometimes uh, Yule Moshta, the boar that the god Frey would ride. Another common tradition is to decorate your homes with goats, symbolizing Thor, representing his goats, Tangnost and Tangrisni, that would pull his chariot across the sky. Up until the 19th century, it was the goat who would deliver gifts to people's homes. And as a matter of fact, in Finland, Father Christmas is still called Jolopuki, which
which literally translates to Christmas goat. For the Vikings, Yule was strongly connected to Odin, who was also called Yule Father, meaning Yule Father. Or so you see the blind eye. Okay, so these connections are very important. Uh, you know, including Saint Paul of Christianity, and now you have the next form of Christianity by this blind. So Saint Paul, who was anti-Messi, because Saint Paul, those of those people who studied Christianity understand that Paul said everything against what Jesus said. And he opposed every apostle, every disciple of Jesus, peace be upon him. Those of us who are aware of history understand this. And here comes another blind man. And so just uh, to kind of like show this uh, more clearly, uh, St. Paul, uh, St. Uh, Paul was a blind uh, eyed. Let's see if I can find that for you. The blindness of St. Paul. Uh, was uh, so the blindness of Saint Paul and him having uh, one eye is something that is known in Christianity also about uh, Saint Paul. Okay, and uh, so anyway, that's something you guys can look into yourself. Slaver across the sky, visiting people in their homes. This image of Odin was later adopted by the Dutch, who called him Sinterklaas. Sinterklaas would ride over the rooftops, delivering gifts to people during the holiday season. As a matter of fact, even Odin's ravens was transformed by the Dutch into Sinterklaas, two black helpers who would report to him which children had been good or bad during the year. Santa Claus, as we know him today, was given a red outfit and a sleigh with eight reindeers, representing the eight legs of Sleipner uh, in the 19th century, an image made widely popular by the Coca-Cola company in the 1930s. Even though you may not eat phrase boar or... So, <clears throat> there are many dimensions to Christmas uh, that when you deeply look at the whole situation connects with uh, one particular surah of the Quran, which is Surah Al-Kahf, which I'll be talking about. But let us now take one more look at uh, this issue of uh, Ordin and Christianity, and we will then study, take it the next step forward, and relate it with Ya'juj and Ma'juj, and then we will look at other aspects of Christmas. Along with the celebration of the sun gods, the Scandinavians also worshipped this god called Odin. He was the god of intoxicating drink, ecstasy, as well as the god of death. And because of the Feast of Saturnalia, he truly became uh, the most popular god of the Feast of Saturnalia, uh, which was a sun god which we can trace all the way back to Baal himself. Guess who this character became? Look at him very carefully. What does he look like? The colors are wrong, but this guy became Santa Claus. That's right. Odin, or Woden, was the god of wisdom, magic, and occult knowledge, runes, poetry, and war. His name meant the inspired one. He was a tall, old man that had a long white beard and carried a spear or a crozier. He traveled around the world on a white horse that had eight legs, okay, which was in ancient uh, tradition the number of transportation. This is... Who's going to be traveling around the world? ...where the eight reindeer came from. Now you might say, Jim, there's nine. Originally, there was eight. Rudolph was added in modern times. There was eight reindeer, and it comes from that white horse that Odin traveled around on that had the eight legs. You can look up all of this stuff. It's very a common knowledge on the internet and in encyclopedias. You can see Odin and, and all the reference material that goes with it. By the 1500s in Holland, there he became Sinterklaas. Okay, so St. Nicholas turned into Sinterklaas, a kind and wise old man with a white beard, white dress, red cloak, a crozier, and he r rode on the skies and the roofs of the houses on his white horse, accompanied by his blackjacks, leaving gifts for people under his sacred tree, the fir tree. He would visit you on his birthday, December 25th, of course, and give you gifts if you've been good, or if you've been bad, his blackjacks would beat you. By the year 1700, a Dutchman immigrated to North America, brought his Santa Claus with him. The English dialect was then changed to Santa Claus. In 1930, a designer for the Coca-Cola company was trying to get people in the, in the wintertime to buy their drink. So they took their company colors of red and white, borrowed the Santa Claus story, changed a few things, and out came the modern Santa Claus, complete with reindeer and elves. So that 1930 designer borrowed a picture from, I think it was the 1800s, and modernized it, added the colors, and out came the Coca-Cola Coca -Cola Santa Claus that we see today, complete with the long white beard and chubby cheeks and the red and white suit. 
So there you go. Uh, that's a small introduction to Odin. Odin became Santa Claus. And Odin is this, you know, god that's has he gave up his one eye to be able to see the universe, to see everything in the universe. That's kind of like how the story goes. Okay. Giving us the present day holidays um, that we see. Number one, we understand that Isa alayhi salam, according to uh, the different reports of the different scholars in, in many religions, he was not born in the cold weather. History shows us that he was born during the warm weather. Even in the Christian traditions, they have the belief that the shepherds were tending their flocks outside. And in Palestine, you cannot keep your flocks outside. In the wintertime, in the evening, you bring them in because it's cool at night. And so it was the warm weather. It was also the time of the taxes in the north. In the story coming in the Quran, when we see the mention uh, in chapter 19 in verses 24 to 25, and we see the mention of the story of Mary, because it is the belief of the Muslims that Maryam, may Allah be pleased with her, was a virgin, and she had dedicated her life to the worship of one God, prayer and fasting, and by the power of Allah that the Creator breathed His Spirit into her, and she, she conceived Jesus, He said, Be and it is, she conceived Jesus, Isa alayhi salam, without a father, without a man. That is a belief of Islam. It is also a belief that when she felt the pain of the pregnancy, that, that, that the angel came to her and told her to go outside of the city, she went outside of the city to a remote area, and there she found uh, a palm tree and she found water. And it was speaking about rutub, jannah. It was speaking about a type of rutub or a type of dates. And those who know, who live in the desert area know that when the dates um, become ripe, when you start to see the color of the dates change, because dates are not brown, you know. Dates are originally red and they're yellow, they're other colors. But they turn the brown. It's, it's at the height of the heat that the dates become ripe. And so it's at that time that she gave birth to Isa alayhi salam. So from different points of view, different historical points of view and different religions, we understand that Isa alayhi salam was not born during the winter season. He was born in the warm weather. So who was it that was born in the winter? Just so you're clear, dates come out in the summer, not winter. So he was, when he was being born, Maryam was told to take from Rutub and Jania. So from the dates. Winter season. What is that? Who is that character now? Let us become detectives and try to find out the answer to this problem. Number one, you have to understand this concept of Saturn, the concept of Bacchus. When they are portrayed by the different artists who drew pictures of them or the sculptures, they're usually portrayed as a heavy set man with a white beard. And when in the Sistine Chap Chapel, uh, Michelangelo drew his picture, you could see the long flowing beard, and there are actually pictures of this man on a sled being drawn by snakes with wings. Snakes with wings. Snakes do not normally fly. But in this case, the snakes have wings, and the heavy set man is on his sled being drawn by these flying animals. Sound familiar to you now, doesn't it? He's being drawn by the flying out So two connections here. You know, the, the flying reindeers as well as flying objects like jinns in the Shayateen. He's before performing miracles. He's, he's coming out on December 25th, which is not the birthday of Isa alayhi salam. has nothing to do with Christianity. It is the time of the, of the Bacchanalia and, and, and the Saturnalia. And he is representing riotous fun, drunken reveries. And so what happens on Christmas, the Christmas season, especially in America, People today are not even thinking about Isa alayhi salam. They're not even thinking about Jesus. They're looking how they can get drunk. On Christmas, what is going on? In the Caribbean and many parts, if they offer you a Christmas pudding, or Christmas pie, or Christmas drink, watch out. Because it's probably laced with rum or wine. That's the spirit of the season. Now this riotous occasion that was going on went so far that the Christian church banned it. And the Church of England, according to historical sources, actually banned it all the way to 1647. It was prohibited in England to celebrate Christmas because they saw Christmas as being a pagan holiday. This is an official position taken by the Christian church. The church of England were known at that time as Puritans. What happened was an individual was superimposed. A name was superimposed. We hear about the name of uh, St. Nicholas. St. Nicholas. Now, St. Nicholas himself is actually coming from Nick or Nickel or Nicker. He was known as a demon. This is an ad to tell you that Bud Light Seltzer is made with a unique five-step filtration process. The demon of the north. He was known as the evil spirit of the north, the name of Odin, the evil principle. And so in Germany and in many of the northern countries, the people actually looked upon this so-called Saint Nick as being an evil force. And they would tell their children in the wintertime, don't go outside because if you do, Nicholas will come along, Nickel will come along, he'll capture you, put you in his bag and take you away. 
And so they used it as a negative concept in Isaiah, in what is left of the Bible, in chapter 4, in, in 14, 13. The devil is, is known as the prince of darkness. And it is an understanding that his throne, the seat of his power is in the north. Somewhere in the north is the seat. It doesn't have to be the North Pole, but north of particularly the wall of Zulkarnain, which is a longer discussion. Of power of this evil. And so the Germans also, when they depicted this Nicholas, or this uh, Pels Nickel, as they would say, Pels Nickel in German, it means a furry devil. When they, when they depicted him, they depicted him as a man with red fur. He had red fur coat. And he was, his base was in the north, and he was the essence of evil. And the Church of England, till 1647, took the position that this celebration could not go on. So what we are actually seeing is that the, the, the Christmas occasion was actually the time of evil. It was a time of the belief in the Saturnalia and the Bacchanalia. And because of this, they shifted the occasion to New Year's Eve. They shifted all of their feelings and their merriment and their evil to New Year's Eve. Now, before we go to that, looking back at, back at Christmas, what is happening now in Christmas season? I don't know what goes on in Miami, but in the northern cities, on Christmas occasion, they, they put lights around and Santa Claus parades. Do you have a Santa Claus parade here? They have Santa Claus parades and St. Nicholas is outside and he's in the streets and everybody's talking about St. Nicholas. And the poor children are taught that St. Nicholas is going to come down your chimney. Most people don't have chimneys in Miami anyway. But a 350 pound man is going to come down your chimney and bring you presents and keep his clothes white and red. And go to all of the homes in the area and, and put uh, um, uh, presents in your stockings and, and, and put uh, uh, presents under your tree and then fly back out into space. And, and the father, the poor father who sweat and toiled all year to get you the presents gets no credit for the present given to the child. St. Nicholas comes down the chimney, gives you this present, flies off into the night. And many of us were raised thinking, believing in this. Some of us would sneak into the night and look and see our father putting the present under the tree. We knew what he was doing anyway. But you went along with it and the people say, well, you know, it's, it's Christmas. Don't you like to have fun? You want to stop the children from having fun? What kind of people are you? But what, is the, what are you teaching the children? You're using the name of Jesus, using the name of Isa alayhi salam, and you are using a figure who historically is the devil. The devil himself, wal iyadu billah. They are using his figure, and he has now taken over the Christmas season. Christmas now to most people means materialism. You have to buy presents for your cousins and your friends, and you've got to buy about 34 uh, presents. And you find that most American people are in debt for six months after Christmas. Now, where is Jesus? You get drunk? You fight? That's true, and I've actually seen that. You lose all your money? The stores raise their prices? Isa alayhi salam is described as a very humble person. Most of the time he didn't wear shoes. Only one or two changes of clothing. A very simple person eating very simple food, fasting most of the time. You see what's going on? There are two streams now, a stream of polytheism, a stream of monotheism. And now the polytheism, the materialism is overtaking the monotheism and standing in the way and taking over our society. And some foolish Muslims coming along from outside of in their country say, well, I just want to be an American. Um, I want a tree too. So I said, one of the brothers said he had a Christmas tree in his house. He came for, I said, brother, do you know what the tree stands for? He said, no, uh, okay, I'll get a palm tree with dates. I'll, I'll make it halal, a halal Christmas tree. But brother, you have to understand what it means. You have to understand what it means. Number one, the Prophet ﷺ, when he spoke about, he talked about uh, in the Ar-Ruqya, wa tamaim, wa tiwala. He said, all of these things are shirk. That if you hang amulets, thinking that this ta'weez, or this amulet is going to protect you from something, then you are actually giving power to, to, to the creation of Allah. I am a technological superintelligence. Is this James Corden? No, my analysis showed that hearing James Corden's voice would calm you. And taking it away from the Creator. If you think that by making some spells, going to a magician, and asking them to put a spell on someone, you want to get married. So you go to the Sahir and say, put a spell on Ali, I want to marry him. Put a spell on Zainab. What kind of marriage are you going to have if you go to the magician? And so the Prophet, peace be upon him, named all of these things, the superstitions, the amulets, all of these type of things are the other stream which goes away from monotheism, from the belief in one God, and takes you into another. Religion. So let's now continue looking at another aspect of Christmas. So now let's talk about Lying to kids. Remember, the jal is the deception of lying. He's a liar, right? Dajjal means to lie and to deceive. And kids are being lied to by their parents all across America, all across the Western world, till like the age of seven and eight. And sometimes when they learn about the fact that they've been lied to, it's very devastating for them. And it definitely breaks the trust with parents. So I have a lot of concerns about parents lying to their children around Christmas time. 
it happens every year. Parents will tell their kids about Santa Claus. They'll say that, you know, Santa Claus is watching over them. That he is going to know if they're naughty or nice. He's making a list and checking it twice. Um, that he brings presents. That the elves make the presents in the North Pole. And Santa Claus gets on his magical sleigh with his magical flying reindeer. Flies all over the world in one night. And delivers presents to all the kids. And, uh, you know, they do things like, you know, I, I know a person who, not, he doesn't just tell the lie, but he, um, he goes out of his way to lie to his kids. You know, he'll set out uh, trip cookies for Santa Claus. And he puts out hay for the reindeer. And when the kids go to bed, he goes in and eats the cookies and leaves crumbs on the tray and tells them Santa came and ate the cookies. He goes outside and kicks the hay around and makes a big mess with the hay and tells them that the, that the deer came by and they ate the, rain, uh, the reindeer came by and they ate the hay. And, you know, they, they put presents under the tree with, this is from Santa. And, you know, all kinds of stuff, just going out of their way to lie to their kids. And it's not healthy. It's not good for your kids. You, we should not be lying to our children. That's wrong. The Bible tells us not to lie. And yet Christian parents all over the world lie to their kids about Santa Claus. But what's worse, and, and the thing that I'm more concerned with, is that when they do these things, they're presenting their kids with a false god. Because everything they're saying about Santa Claus is attributes of the real God. They say that Santa Claus is uh, able to see everything that goes on. He knows if you've been naughty or nice. He's making a list. Those are attributes of God. You know, the Bible says that God is able to see everything that goes on. He knows whether you're good or bad. And that, you know, he has a list. He has a book of life. And those whose names are written in the book of life will be given eternal life. And those whose names are not written in the book will be given. So that's one aspect, is being lied to when it comes to Christmas. Christmas is coming, and you know what that means. It's the season of lies. Yeah, being dishonest may be the biggest tradition we have surrounding this holiday. We lie to children this time of year more than any other time. We lie about someone having a list of who's naughty and who's nice. We lie when we say Santa is watching over you, even when you're sleeping. We lie when we tell children that if they send a personal message to Santa, like with a letter. So continuing on the relationship between Christmas, Odin, the one-eyed guy, and there are many others that are of the same category as this, uh, and how it relates to Christmas. So you have Odin. Odin's quest for wisdom is never ending. He's willing to pay the, at any price. And the price that he paid was his one eye. Okay? And so that's, if you look at Odin's pictures, they're always why Odin is one eyed, right? Um, then if you go further, you know, this is the Viking history again. Odin is one eyed guy over here. Uh, was Santa Claus. You know, influenced by Odin. Here's Santa Claus and Odin sitting together, so to say. And uh, uh, the wild uh, hunt of Odin painting. And, uh, you know, it continues. Now, uh, I want to actually show Odin, the one eyed All Father. Okay. And uh, if you read here, Santa Claus owes his very existence to the old Norse myths. Myths, sorry. He changed a lot over the centuries, but his origins are in Scandinavia, okay? And those of you who've been studying Yajuj and Ma'juj properly will know that uh, Scandinavia is one of the countries. In fact, if you type in on the internet, Gog, Magog, and uh, uh, where will I? If you type in Vikings, or if you type in Gog Magog in English, you'll see the relationship with a group from Scandinavia. Scandinavia. Okay, so these are the Vikings, and so there's the relationship between Odin and Yajuj and Majuj, which is and the leader of Yajuj and Majuj is a blind man. Uh, now I'm going to come to that in a second. So let me show you some of the historical pictures. Uh, the west entrance to the Cathedral of Avila in Spain, showing Gog Magog. Okay, so these are the two sons of Nuh and Yafis, Gog Magog. Over here is a archaeological finding in the Cathedral of Avila. In the same way, you have uh, the Royal Arcade in Melbourne in, um, in Australia. You have, so this part of the world, uh, let me just show you another picture here. Uh, these stone hedges have to do with this too. Uh, uh, so uh, Jordan's claim, Magog is the ancestor of Goths. Gods are people in England, and that whole area of 
Wales and Scandinavia and the Vikings. Okay, and some of these, uh, some of these people, they accepted Judaism as their religion. Okay, and so the giant statues honoring Gog Magog in London's uh, Guild Hall. Okay, so again, these are Gog pictures of Gog Magog. Uh, the 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 Lord Mayor of London celebrates his sh show with Gog Magog companions. Okay, and so you have statues of Gog Magog parade in London. Okay, because they're known as the fathers of the the Gauls, and the Gauls are basically English people. Okay, and so there is now a direct relationship between. Uh, Santa Claus basically being the person who is uh, uh, Santa Claus being the uh, person who is Odin connected to Odin and Odin is the one-eyed man okay the one-eyed uh, Odin has many names and it is the god of both war and death okay and uh, he's the one-eyed all-father okay and so uh, it's not by chance that Christmas started in the last few centuries again from Christianity. And so uh, Christmas is a time of materialism. And so there's a lot of ads that are special Christmas ads, right? So before we finally look into, um, you know, some more of those uh, Christmas presents, uh, let's look into the idea of, uh, let's look into this, okay? So here are some examples of Christmas and materialism. Now remember, this is supposed to be a time of giving and sharing and a time of, you know, spirituality. But what you see is it's just pushing materialism. And why this is relevant is the Kahf is a surah that is anti-materialism. And it is a surah that criticizes Christianity. You know, in some ways it is connected with the Maryam, which explains the real purpose of Jesus, peace be upon him. But Christianity that becomes materialism and that Christianity that becomes infused with paganism. paganism. So that's, that's what's happened to Christianity now. So notice how this song. notice how something very evil can later on be made to look good, and now every, the people all over the West lie about Santa Claus. The season served the very best at any gathering. Served delicious chicken tenders from Burger King. And like someone said, it became less and less about family and more and more about what did you buy for me? Meatbreast fillets, not four bits and pieces. Holiday baking deserves real butter. Make a cinnamon roll tree, sugar cookies, marzipan, and more. Bake ahead, real butter's baked in flavor improves with age. Taste all the way. Butter helps you say happy holidays throughout the year. To only at Radio Shack. Come meet my special Disney friends. Here. Here. Now only at Hardee's when you buy any sandwich, fries, and Coca-Cola. Get a Mickey, Minnie, Goofy, Donald, or Uncle Scrooge stuffed toy for only a dollar ninety-nine. They have missed before. Had a nose went to flash and can flash again in one and one third seconds. All you do is push one button. The Kodak Disc 4000 camera. Bet you know someone who'd love one. It's your brand new world. How are you? Oops, stop. My little brother Joey asked me to write you. He's only five. Here are a few things he hopes he'll bring the family this so you guys get the point and they've done this with every you know just it's just become very materialistic now one of the last things i want to deal with is the christmas tree itself
90% of Americans celebrate Christmas in one way or another, according to the Pew Research Center. The holiday began in the 4th century when church officials chose to honor the birth of Jesus. But several customs we've come to associate with modern-day Christmas actually evolved from ancient pagan traditions celebrating the winter solstice. Historian Kenneth C. Davis is the best-selling author of the Don't Know Much About series, which we love. Welcome back to the table. Merry Christmas Merry to you. Christmas to you. It's always a pleasure to be here. So this is something I've always been fascinated by, because the Bible never talks about the date of Christ's birth, yet we celebrate December 25th. Why? Well, primarily because in ancient Rome, there was a feast called Saturnalia that celebrated the solstice. What is the solstice? It's the day that the sun starts coming back. The days start getting longer. And most of the traditions that we have that relate to Christmas relate to the solstice, which was celebrated in ancient Rome on December 25th. So when Christianity became the official religion, in a sense, in Rome, they were able to fix this date, which some scholars say may be earlier than that. There's a little discrepancy about it, but it's no question that the fact that it was celebrated in Rome as an important day with gift giving, candle lighting, and singing and decorating houses really cemented Christmas as December 25th. You always say you don't know much according to your books, but do you know why we have a Christmas tree as opposed to a bunch of hydrangeas? Well, or really, pretty. this is another being pretty. This is another about that, Ken? This is another pagan tradition. So Christmas is really about bringing out your inner pagan. The Christmas tree really <laughs> comes to who knew we which, had it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The wise men said that. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's like Halloween and a lot of other things we do, these all predate Christianity. Uh -huh. But in the Norse world, Germany, uh, the, uh, the Scandinavian countries, where winter was really serious and the solstice was really an important idea, they celebrated the return of life by celebrating an evergreen tree. When Christianity came in, they started to use the evergreen tree, the pagan symbol, as a symbol of the tree of paradise. Mm -hmm. And they started to hang an apple on it. So little red balls oh. on green trees. Oh, that's the ornaments. Here. That's where the idea that's for right. ornaments So came. all of these things really celebrate the idea that light and life are coming back into the world, which is essentially what Christmas means to Christians. Uh, across the world. Right. And mistletoe? Mistletoe, we can thank the Druids for that. The Druids believed that mistletoe was an all-powerful healing item. It hung from the sacred oak. In fact, if you met somebody in the forest, you gave them the sign of peace under the mistletoe. So people started to hang mistletoe above their doorways as a symbol of peace. This was such a powerful symbol of paganism yeah. that English churches actually banned the use of it. And in fact, the real war on Christmas in America begins with the Puritans in around 1659. They knew all of these things, the date, the traditions, were pagan ideas. The Puritans banned Christmas for about 20 years in America before the, the celebration became just too popular. You'll be glad to know all of your answers today were correct. <laughs> <laughs> you know a lot, Kenneth C. Davis. Fact checker over here. So that's as far as, uh, you know, the history of that is concerned. Now, as far as the tree itself is concerned, uh, this is in Jeremiah in the Bible itself. So Christians shouldn't celebrate the tree either. And I just want to make that clear. In Jeremiah 10, it says, ye, Hear ye the word which the Lord speaketh unto you, O house of Israel. Thus said, saideth the Lord, Learn not the ways of the heathen, meaning the pagans, and be not dismayed at the signs of the heaven. For the heathen are dismayed at them. I mean, don't do, or don't look at the zodiac signs and stuff. For the customs of the people are in vain. For one cutteth a tree out of a forest, and work of hands of workmen with the axe. So you know, going to the forest and cutting a tree to get the Christmas tree, so to say. They deck it with silver and gold. See? That's what you do with the Christmas tree. They fasten it with nails, with hammers, that it may not move. They are upright as palm tree, but speak not. They must, uh, they must, uh, they, they must needs to be be born, because they cannot go. Be not afraid of them, for they do cannot do evil. Neither also is in it them to do good. Meaning, for as much as there is none like unto thee, O Lord, thou art great. Thy name is greater in might. So. Basically, even many Christians put, uh, point to this passage as a passage that basically tells us, do not be celebrating Christmas. So that's especially true for Muslims, but it's also true for Christians, because Christians are not supposed to be pagans. Okay, And so we need to get out of this materialistic culture. We need to get out of lying to our kids. We need to get away from Santa Claus as far as possible. And uh, then the last thing I want to show you before I end is uh, going to be another humorous thing. Trees have been worshipped by virtually every pagan culture in the world and was again a major symbol of sun god worship and fertility. It took the place inside uh, the pagan home of the, the obelisk. The, the fir tree took the place of that obelisk as a picture or a symbol of the sun god. That's why they put the sunburst or the eight-pointed star on top of it. 
The fir tree was said to be a magical tree because it remained green all year long. It was decorated in some cultures with fruit to symbolize new life, and in other cultures it was decorated with 12 candles to honor their sun god. Because the, the Feast of Saturnalia was 12 days. That's where you get the 12 days of Christmas from. Today we even sing songs to it, just like they did in the pagan worship rituals. Jeremiah 10, verses 2 and following says, Thus says the Lord, or Yahweh, Do not learn the way of the Gentiles. Do not be dismayed at the signs of heaven. For the Gentiles are dismayed at them. For the customs of the people are futile. For one cuts a tree down from the forest, the work of the hands of a workman with the axe. They decorate it with silver and gold. They fasten it with nails and hammers so that it will not topple. They are upright like a palm tree, and they cannot speak. They must be carried because they cannot go by themselves. Do not be afraid of them, for they cannot do evil, nor can they do any good. Now, many people believe that this particular scripture is talking about Christmas trees themselves. The truth of the matter is this particular scripture is not really connected to Christmas trees, as it is the idea that they took and they, they, they went to the woods, they got fir trees, and then they would carve them, and they would decorate them with silver and gold. And what I wanted to point out with the scripture is that the whole decorating with silver and gold uh, balls, uh, which actually, believe it or not, are, are represented in ancient cultures as the testicles of the sun god uh, that went on the shaft, uh, of, of, of Baal with the symbol of the pagan fertility right of the sun burst on top of it. That's where they got the silver and gold from. It was the idea that they decorated their idols with silver and gold. So that's what I wanted to pull from this scripture. Not necessarily that they're cutting down a Christmas tree. That tradition didn't happen until later. But this is where they got the idea from because idols were decorated with silver and gold. We see again uh, very closely, if you look closely on this Mexican sun god idol that we showed you before, you will see the fir tree. This fir tree ends up becoming, as we know today, what we call the Christmas tree. Let's end by looking at what Christmas presents teaches the kids, uh, maybe as inadvertently, though. But for Christmas, Merry Christmas! Christmas Day, Santa will bring you a car. <laughs> oh, what's the matter? Don't you like broccoli?
Okay. So that's the mess Christmas is creating. And now you know about the one eye guy that's technically behind all of this. And the lies we tell the kids, the pagan rituals that come out. Uh, in fact, of all of these holidays from Easter to Thanksgiving to Christmas to New Year, the re New Year's resolution, it's all pagan. It's all pagan. It's all devil worship. It's all idol worship. And uh, that's just the historical reality. And it's all just materialism. Okay? And so I'm going to end here in regards to this issue. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.